It was some 35 years ago that the world was introduced to the ATM, but interestingly, there's about 30,000 of them in Australia. At the actual activity, the amount of times people are using it has decreased. So today on Download the Show, we are asking the question, is it the end? of the ATM. We are joined by our panellists this week. Claire Conley is a freelance technology reporter and Matt Hopkins is the editor of the technology and finance website, The Hip Pocket. Is it premature to call the end of the ATM? I think it's going to be a slow process. Um, Death of a thousand swipes. There it is. (laughs) Death of a thousand taps. If I thought that joke through, it would have worked. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, it's just a symptom of the decline of cash use Mm. as a whole. Um, So many places have made it so easy to pay tap and go, even with your phone now, places are even accepting Bitcoin. So it's going to be a slow process. I don't think it's going to happen overnight, but it's definitely going to get there for sure. Uh, I think that cashless and and direct transfer apps and payment systems will be the new competitors to the ATM. The idea that we have to wait three days for our cash to process while it sits on the stock exchange is really kind of quite an antiquated concept. Do you think it changes our relationship with money, the less time we spend holding physical cash, Matt? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think you're more inclined when you can't see a balance in front of you to just swipe away on that card, whether it's a credit card or a debit card. Um, So yeah, I think it does. I think it detaches us from what we actually have. Is there a cultural shift or perhaps maybe a generational shift in the way um, younger people that have only ever dealt with money in that environment relate to cash? There is a culture shift, but I'm I'm hoping it's going to be towards a better understanding of money and better ways of managing it now that there's more options available Mm. rather than carelessness. I have a theory that as the economy shifts, particularly millennials, you know, anyone born sort of after 1980, I do think the rise of the popularity of debit and credit cards, it allows people to more accurately keep track of their finances. Now, while it may technically be the same thing to go to an ATM and take out cash and pay on debit or credit card, there's something more mathematical about when you swipe your card, you kind of do the maths in your head. This is what my balance is going to look like after this transaction. Whereas cash, I don't know about you guys, it just disappears and you kind of go, well, $10 went to food and maybe 25 went to fuel and, and people aren't very good at keeping log books and when it comes to but a digital But day- a digital system will actually keep track of everything for you and often I, I will confess that I put things on a credit card that I definitely have cash for simply because I want to keep track. Yeah. There are a lot of apps coming out now mm. like Pocketbook and, uh, and things like that that make it easy to keep track of your money. So I think that um, people are getting a little smarter but I guess the only way that's really changed is just people are using cards for smaller transactions now. Yeah. I think five years ago you couldn't pay for a coffee on, on, a, on a card, you know what I mean? Whereas now it's just more of an accepted thing. And, and do you think some of that is driven by the the ease of things like tap and go, where you don't even have to go through the rigmarole of putting in a PIN number? He says as though it's like the hardest thing in the world. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'd, I'd remember my four numbers. But you, it does have that effect of it almost doesn't feel like a payment at all. Do you think that changes the perception of it as a purchase? Um, I think we're so used to things changing so quickly that I don't think we see it any differently than putting in a PIN number. I think it's just more convenient. Also, the decline in in minimums for what you can pay for on a card. You know, like you were saying five years ago, you know, less than $15, you get laughed out of the shop. Whereas now that incentive seems to have been removed so that you can just pay for everything Mm. on card. But I do wonder, has that had the impact of increasing ATM fees when you do go to an ATM? Because I've noticed a lot more of them are charging, you know, $2.50 and above than maybe were even a year ago. Is there any potential of a cashless society in the future or is cash always going to have a role? Um, I mean, Denmark have already set a deadline of 2030 to be completely cashless, which when you think about it, it's not that far away. That so it really is no. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, if they're going to do it, I think the rest of the world's going to follow suit, albeit a little slowly, but it'll happen, yeah. You wonder what that effect has on the way that we view currency? Because currency has always been kind of tied to nationalism and it, you look at the notes and you've got all of the, the different, mm. you know, you've got the Queen, for example. Does currency just become, go back to the trade for goods and services or does it go like hyper, this is the thing that we don't use anymore, but it nonetheless defines who we are? 
Well, I've always defined Australia by like Australia may not be the greatest at a whole bunch of things, but our cash is the best looking. So that's always <laughs> that's been my true. thing. That, it's that's also my plastic. Tiny which, yeah. brand of nationalism. In 2016, <laughs> the idea people are still using paper that you can be like, oh, I went for a surf and now all my money's gone. Australia is one of the few countries that doesn't have that problem. All right, we'd love to know if your experience of using ATMs has changed and particularly what sort of technology is driving the change in your experience. You can listen to the whole audio edition of this on the RN website or you can leave a comment on our Facebook page. Thanks, guys.